Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Where would science fiction be without visions of super machines? Faster, smarter, and stronger than humans. Their intelligence often best measured by a wish to do us harm. The Terminator. Human beings are a disease, and we are the cure. Anxiety about robots came baked in from the beginning. The word first appeared in a 1920s play, which depicted a race of artificial servants wiping us out. The fear remains fresh today, and not just in fiction. Bill Gates adds his voice to the growing concern that artificial intelligence could one day be dangerous enough to threaten humanity. Google just made one giant leap to outsmarting mankind. But how worried should we really be? They say it got smart. A new order of intelligence. This isn't the first time Hollywood fear about artificial intelligence has spilled into the news. Nearly two decades ago, it was an international story. A chess game that is much bigger than chess. Between world chess champion Kerry Kasparov and IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. All the major TV networks have covered it, and it's been beamed to 20 countries around the world. Everybody build it like this was the Terminator come to potentially take down the humans. IBM's 3,000 pound supercomputer, which can calculate 200 million chess positions per second. I was rooting for Kasparov to kick its ass. There's no question about it. While Maurice Ashley was giving live commentary on the match, Murray Campbell was rooting for Deep Blue. He helped design it. Chess was commonly considered to be a grand challenge for computer science. The earliest computer scientists latched onto that. They, they sort of, in the, in the 1940s and 50s, they said, if we can get a computer to play chess, we've really done something. Kasparov had beaten a simpler version of the computer the year before, and both times, news coverage hyped the dual stakes. A game with serious implications. Kasparov has said it's more than a showdown. In a way, he says, it's a defense of the whole human race. The first round of 1997's rematch suggested Kasparov had the upper hand. He won game one versus the deep blue supercomputer. Rematch in fantastic style. But game two changed everything. About 35 moves in, Kasparov set a trap, offering the computer an enticing chance to capture pieces with its queen. Deep blue refused the bait and instead made a shrewder choice. It was stunning to see a computer play like that. When you have a choice between an aggressive, sharp, tactical move uh, that is concrete and specific uh, versus a subtle positional move, that's really where the, the grandmaster is shown. Those sequence of moves showed Kasparov the Deep Blue was playing at a level beyond what he had imagined it could do. A shaken Kasparov resigned about 10 moves later and he never beat Deep Blue again. He fought to a series of draws until, in the sixth and final game, the weary human champ fell apart completely. There was no reason for him to play chess like this. He never plays chess like this. He resigned about an hour and three minutes into the game. I have to apologize again. I'm ashamed by what I did at the end of this match. Media pronouncements on the outcome's gloomy implications were swift. We humans are trying to figure out our next move. Call it a blow against humanity. The victory seemed to raise all those old fears of superhuman machines crushing the human spirit. But computer scientists had a different reaction. Every time a computer does some narrow thing uh, better than a person, there's a temptation to think that it's all over for us. But Deep Blue doesn't play chess the way Kasparov plays chess. Deep Blue processes information much like a bulldozer processes gravel. Every slice of capability that we've seen computers become really good at and even superhuman at are actually one small, sort of small pieces of the breadth of intelligent behaviors that we exhibit. At IBM, Guru Banavar is helping build the digital descendant of Deep Blue. It's a talking, self-teaching system, nimble enough to play Jeopardy. In fact, it's become very hard to beat. 
IBM supercomputer called Watson has defeated two of the best contestants in Jeopardy history. Who is Michael Phelps? Yes, Watson. What is the last judgment? Correct. Go again. Watson. IBM says systems like this could one day put the very latest medical research at doctors' fingertips in the exam room. My vision for Watson is that someday every professional on the planet will have a Watson supporting them to do their job. There's no doubt in my mind that machines that are intelligent will have as big an impact as the world as computers have had, probably surpass it. And it'll have very practical applications from everyday little things to solving the mysteries of science. Yet coverage of AI's recent successes often takes an anxious tone. The potential risk of robots ruling the world. And the fears receiving the most vivid attention concern the near future. We're all starting to learn now, these computers, and it becomes very, very scary. Yes. The worry is that advances that took us from room-sized computers to iPhones in a few short decades will soon accelerate dramatically. Before long, we could see systems as smart as humans, capable of improving on their own, and totally escaping our control. The doomsday scenario that some see is that computers will be so smart, they won't need us or want us. Tech billionaire Elon Musk says artificial intelligence is actually the biggest threat to us all. Stephen Hawking told the BBC that its development could spell the end of the human race. So how close is reality coming to these fears? The people working to solve some of AI's toughest problems may be in a unique position to know. For example, before smart machines could run amok, they'll need to walk. At MIT, Russ Tedrake leads a team of engineers trying to program one of the most advanced humanoid robots ever built, an earlier model of this new Atlas robot. It can go into a disaster scenario, you name it, it can walk over rough terrain, it can climb stairs, walk up ladders. The level of complexity that we can deal with is absolutely state-of-the-art and beyond. And if machines are going to walk, they'll need to recognize what's in front of them. At Stanford, Fei-Fei Li is teaching a computer to describe objects it sees in pictures for the first time. A man is standing next to an elephant. A large airplane sitting on top of an airport runway. We're really on the quest for building machines and computers to have that kind of visual intelligence that eventually can match to humans. Visual intelligence is about seeing the objects, understanding the scene, reasoning about the visual story. At MIT, Patrick Henry Winston is programming systems to carry out the kind of basic reasoning people use to interpret stories. Ultimately, we're trying to model aspects of human story understanding. To take an example from Shakespeare, Macbeth murders Duncan. Well, we know that that means that Duncan's dead. What is it that makes human intelligence different from the intelligence of something like a chimpanzee or a Neanderthal? And for me, it's the ability to tell stories. Each of these scientists' projects amounts to an engineering moonshot in its own right. Yet each aims to replicate just one facet of the general intelligence humans take for granted. And none of these researchers see a finish line in view. This is absolutely one of those very state-of-the-art machines. But it is not capable of even some of the things that we'd expect a toddler to be able to do very effectively. I'm not trying to say uh, we didn't work hard <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, we have made a lot of progress, but I think it's important to understand we are closer to a wash machine than, than a Terminator. A man riding a horse down the street next to a building. A young boy is holding a baseball bat. The closer you come to doing research in this area, the more you re realize how difficult everything is. We don't know when those discoveries will come, but they look like there's going to be many of them, not just one. And these scientists say some of the AI nightmare scenarios fail to grasp a paradox that underlies much of the work in artificial intelligence. Things that are easy for humans are hard for computers, and things that are easy for computers are hard for humans. So take, for example, um, common sense. Now, you know, we take for granted that uh, if I had a glass of water on a table and you slightly tilt the table that there's a risk of the water spilling or maybe the, the glass uh, tumbling over and, you know, everything being wet and all of this stuff. Teaching a computer the physical reality of why all of that is happening or that may happen in the future is a very, very difficult task. 
I mean, that's just one example. There are billions of things like that. We don't even know how many, num how many things like this exist. And how about the worry that smart machines will cross some threshold where they beget exponentially smarter ones in the blink of an eye? The problem is, even a powerful intelligence needs to learn much of what it knows by trial and error in the real world. I created some intelligent machines that are smarter than myself. They're my daughters. And, you know, and, I, and it took 20 years to train them, and they're going to take another 20 years to do it. And it's not running away. And um, it's not running away and sort of out of control here. Um, and I think that people don't realize that intelligence isn't something you just, it's not a dial, you just turn up. Some scientists say the real AI tech that's coming soon will likely reveal its downsides by doing the kinds of things technology has done before. Eliminating certain kinds of jobs, concentrating wealth, or simplifying efforts to track our every move. As for the question of Hollywood fears... I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. These AI researchers say we're safe from those for now. All right. I think you can't watch this robot without thinking, wow, they've got a long way to go. You know, we like to joke his batteries only last an hour, so, you know, uh, even if he ran amok, he couldn't get very far.